Good morning. Good morning. This is April 15th, 2003. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. And this morning we have with us Charles Zedek. Charles, welcome. Would you spell your last name for us so we get it right here? Sure. Z-E-T-T-E-K. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Charles. May I ask when you were born? Yes, I was born in the middle of the United States, uh, 1921. Well, can we be a little more specific? <laughs> can you narrow that down to Oklahoma or something? <laughs> where were you born? That's where I was born, in Kansas. Kansas? The state of Kansas. Okay. And what is your current address? Uh, in Hopkinton. It's Marital status? Absolutely a wonderful marriage, and her name is Ann. Good for 50, you. 52 years now, five children, wonderful life. Congratulations to you. Charles, when and where did you enter the military? Uh, it was 1942, late 42, and it was in San Francisco. And how did you come to enter it? Uh, were you drafted or you enlisted? Oh, no. no, I was uh, doing some um, research work at the, you know, at the uh, University of uh, California in Berkeley. And um, Pearl Harbor was not too far away from California, so I was trying to wrap up what I was doing and get into the war as soon as possible. When you entered the military, then did you have choices as to which branch of service you could get into? I wanted to get into flying, so I went over to an airfield um, around San Francisco and signed up there. Was that a, a recruiting officer or something like that? No, there was, that stuff hadn't started yet that early in the war, so uh, I just went on my own. and. Uh, told them where I, what I wanted to do, and they said, well, sign up, <laughs> no problem. And you then they sent me then immediately to uh, Santa Ana, California, which is where the cadet training is. When you entered the service, were you by yourself, or did anybody from school no. go with you, any family, S friends? Strictly on my own, I had two sisters mother and a father, and uh, I did it on my own. You said you wanted to fly. Yes. Did that mean literally pilot the plane or be in a plane? Well, uh, I, I think I had in my mind piloting, yes. And so they sent you to Santa Ana? Yes. And were you any in any part of a program, uh, cadet training? Um, Not there. That's strictly a a place where they take people in and make it give you some tests and so on and decide pretty much what they want me to do. Can you tell us about those tests and uh, how evidently it, uh, it, uh, you became accepted, but tell us how they winnowed out who would go where and who would do what? I have no idea, and they didn't tell you how they do that. They didn't tell you what the exam said and where they were going to send you. They just said, uh, you're on your way. <laughs> but you had told them you wanted to be a pilot? Probably. I don't remember that. Where did you go from there? Uh, went to um, uh, Arizona, um, and that's where we had um, training and more exams and so on so they could finally determine just what they wanted you to do for them. And they, based on the tests that they gave and the answers I gave, they put me in a, as a bombardier. That was any chance, if I had any hope, which I didn't really take it seriously or make a big deal of it, if I had any hopes to be a pilot, uh, then that was gone right there. They wanted me to be a bombardier. 
based on, I'm sure it was based on the tests they gave. Was the work, any of the work you did at the University of California connected at all with what eventually happened to you? No, no. I had wonderful uh, training uh, by my next door neighbor uh, when I was growing up. I'm, I was the guy that mowed their back lawn and he happened to be um, a, w, a MIT graduate in architectural, I think it's uh, certain types of architectural engineering. And he would look out his window, the poor man was in bed 90% of his life. He'd had already come down with this um, brain disease and he couldn't, he could hardly talk. He could mumble a little and I could understand him after a while. But I was the lawnmower man and he called me, his wife called me and said, would you like to learn to play chess with my husband? And, sure. You know, and then it was, uh, once I got to understand him, I went in there every day or every other day to see him and he got me taught me how to play chess, one of the things that we would do. But then he taught me everything. He knew he was going to die. And he just tried to tell me, teach me as much as he knew about uh, engineering as taught at MIT, and that helped me tremendously. I remember in, uh, I took a course in high school, the senior uh, part of the uh, program of my life, and uh, I can remember exactly that it was the kind of stuff he taught me. And after a while, I think they'd have a daily project for you on your desk at high school. Do this, do that. And very soon after the, uh, and the teacher would sit up on a bench up and up uh, in front of the school. And after a while, when he saw me coming up with my paper, he'd say, stop. Go back, double A, double plus. And that, <laughs> that's an interesting story because it made a lot of a big difference in my life. Evidently. Charles, in this day and age, when we, we have, we're still in the middle of a war, and the word smart bomb has come into our nomenclature, this didn't exist when, when you were flying and, and becoming a bombardier. It's very difficult for laymen to understand and appreciate how from 20,000 feet you hit something on the ground with some reasonable accuracy. Tell us about your training. How did you, you become a bombardier? How did you learn to hit this thing so far away? Very simple. They, uh, the first place they sent me was to um, a bomber, bombardier training school in Texas. And <clears throat> the way they taught you how to bomb was they had a, a big platform twice the size of this room and they would put you up on a uh, special built um, ladder so you get up in the air and you would have the Norden, the famous Norden bomb site as the instrument that you, they were teaching you to use. And so what you could do by turning the um, knobs on the bomb site, uh, you could move along the floor until you got a good fix on the target of that moment of the even teaching and pull the trigger and they'd know whether how close you came and while well, they had to train you a little more. So it's a secret, it was the introduction to the Norden bomb site, which was the only bombing, accurate bombing instrument of World War II. But your ladder is not moving. The, yes, the ladder moved around, it, it was on wheels. That okay. was the whole point. Okay. You, you could maneuver it and they had it geared up some way so you, you could go head off for the uh, target. So. You're up on a ladder looking through the Norden bomb site or the equivalent Correct. of it. Correct. And is this, is the target unfolding like a rolling carpet under you or is it stationary? 
No, they they must have had a number of big pieces uh, of, of paper or whatever that they would put on the floor and have a different target all the time. But uh, then uh, they at one t uh, turn of yours, you would have to. They say there's the target, and they start up one end of the platform, and you work your way over until you're at the bombing point, and that's we the the machine is going and you pull the trigger and you, you, a light goes on to where you hit or didn't hit. So that was the basic training there. Was how, how long did, did, did you <coughs> do I don't remember that. how long that was. I think it was a month. And they give you more tests, you know, and uh, mathematics and this and that. Strange test, I thought, but there they were. Did you require any physical abilities above and beyond, say, that of a pilot or a navigator? Did you need better eyesight, um, better stamina to be up in the nose of the plane, or was your physical capability any factor in your becoming a bombardier? I wouldn't know the answer to that, but they probably decided from the test the physical test they gave us, the plus uh, the experiences on the you know, the dummy d design system there, dropping bombs. That must have been uh, part of their system. They picked it. But I was in excellent health, as I am today. At, I'm 81 uh, years old now, and I feel like I'm about 30. It's uh, not fair to the rest of the world, I know that, <laughs> but uh, here I am. <laughs> That's marvelous. Yep. That is simply marvelous. Where did you go from that particular station then? Well, then, <clears throat> from there, they, everything was pinned down. I'm a bombardier, and they sent me to an airfield where they were, a new group was being put together. A group meaning four, four squadrons of uh, B-17s making love, the, uh, and the, the name of the group was the 388th Bomb Group. And uh, there are four squadrons in it. And uh, about uh, pretty close to 30 B-17s, four engine, the four engine bomber. Uh, and that's where I was sent, and that was in uh, uh, near Phoenix, not too far away from Phoenix. And that's where I met the guys and became a, I ended up in the uh, 256 uh, uh, squadron, this is the squadron <coughs> that ran their own, they slept in their own areas from then on and got to know each other and they flew together and all that. So this is, you met your crew. These are the guys you were going to be with after this? That's correct. Your pilot, navigator. Right. You were assigned to an yeah. airplane. You meet, you shake hands with a new pilot, the new co-pilot. There are 10 uh, bodies on B-17. You had myself and the, and the going from the front to the back of the bomber. You had uh, the bombardier up in the plastic dome that he sat in the wall, whole, no, nothing in front of you except the world you're looking at as you flew. It's no place for acrophobia, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> and behind, uh, next to me on the table, or with the table, is the uh, navigator. Just behind me and up a couple of steps is the pilot and the co-pilot. And next to them is the engineer who would have a turret, a top turret we called it, and he could get shoot straight up or in all direction with two guns in the uh, in that, and then just going back from there, you go through from there, you walk through the bomb site. I mean, the bomb uh, where the bombs are kept, uh, and go through a little door at the other end of that, and you're then there on your right is the. Uh, uh, Radio uh, expert. Uh, and then you, there are two open windows that don't close. They're just open spaces uh, for the what we call the, <coughs> the side gunners. Two gunners 
uh, could shoot out both directions. And you would be careful, you look down, there's a ball turret under the plane, which is very interesting because that uh, gave us a big advantage over the British bombers who didn't have this, and they were easily shot down. Whereas no, they, the German fighter, when they tried to come up and get us from below, they were dead ducks if they got too close. And then at, in the tail, there was a tail gunner in the tail, and it counted, if you count those people, that's uh, ten people. Every time a plane went down, ten people uh, went with it. Something that I've, I've never asked, uh, your training up on that ladder and subsequent training, did it make any difference what kind of a plane you would eventually be in? For example, if you were s sent into a, a B-24 squadron, would your training pertain all the same? Or was, it, was there any difference depending on the type of a plane you got into? Absolutely What, what if you not. got in a B-26? Well, the, I don't know how the B-26 worked with the bomb site. I, uh, the B-26 uh, was um, the one that uh, took off for Tokyo. Uh, I never really got onto one to see, but they did have a bomb site. It had to be the, the uh, Norden site. Um, the uh, B-24s, which is the uh, ones that uh, were built out in California, started out there. Um, they worked just like on a B-17. Uh, okay. There was no difference because you sat in a chair looking at your bomb site, and from then on, after you got on the what they call the uh, turning point onto a target, you flick on and you're flying the plane with that bomb site. And if it turns left into the wind so that it, the drift puts you on a straight line to the target, that's how it worked. Okay. Where, after you met your crew, you all got together, uh, the pilot is checking out on B-17s or these particular ones. Uh, where did you go from there? Well, we went there, that was a training uh, that, we, that was done in uh, out of uh, Wendover Field, which is on the border of Utah and, and uh, Nevada, <coughs> the middle of nowhere. It was nothing but a, an airstrip there and a few uh, very quickly put up buildings. It's now a bunch of gambling casinos. <laughs> it's a big winner now, <laughs> yeah. almost a city. But that's right, but it was nothing. Uh, the biggest thing in sight there was uh, about a 50-mile drive to a, uh, a good restaurant in the middle of the, of the desert <laughs> between Salt Lake and Reno. And a lot of boys took the time, to, if they had it, to uh, go out and have a good meal, big steak, famous steakhouse. Where did you go from there? Or what did you do at that particular base? Well, we More number practice. one, they had a bombing range yeah. uh, where you could drop, um, you know, with bombs that would ex spill out a lot of smoke where they hit, so you knew where you hit. So we had actual play training with the Norden, myself, and with the Norden, uh, trying to drop a bomb in the barrel. You know, and if you hit the barrel. Uh, you're ready for combat. <laughs> Describe the barrel. What's the size of the barrel? No, well, that's it's a code the target, name. target, I take the it. Code name. You, yeah. you really, you know, you you went right down the barrel. I had no barrel down there. It was just signs that here's a target on the ground. I, I spent a couple of evenings recently reading your history, uh, which is most impressive, and I came to the conclusion that you were not just a bombardier, you were a very good bombardier, and recognized as such by your peers. Do you know why you might have been able to do the job better than other people? Is there some facility that you've looked back on and recognized? Well, the problem with answering that is uh, you won't understand much, but I went through that war 
without getting nervous or tension for one minute. But there were a lot that could. If a lot of the guys walk walk in the bunk, that would get because they're being shot at the whole time, or flak is coming up in target in the in the real war. But I'm I still can't understand why I didn't feel scared or nervous. Um, so that was probably the reason I always had a not a rattling fingers to walk work on the side, but calm. And maybe it was part of the fact that I was uh, a lead bombardier, and uh, that's one of the reasons I got there. But uh, when I became the squadron bombardier the trainee man, um, yeah, I had young people coming up to me at strange times and burst out crying. I was like, what can I do? They're really nervous there. You know, it's a terrible thing to get into war, especially when you're uh, up there and there's only one way out if you get hit. So they, they knew that and it was, but there's a mystery I'll talk about a little later about why I felt uh, no nervousness. Okay. Or do, if you Let's want it sure. now, the, the, the answer is strange. When I came home, uh, and became a, a citizen again. Uh, I didn't, uh, I was calm about the whole thing. The only sign I got was if you're driving along and there's a, uh, uh, what do you call that, from a car ahead, uh, pops the, uh, they said, make a noise when the, the, uh, the exhaust. Backfire. Yeah, yeah, backfire, yeah. yeah. That's what I, I jump like that at the, on the wheel, and I said, "What's what's going on with me?" You know, and that about the only thing. But then, which is the uh, really the end of this particular part of it, uh, I got this book by a um, a pilot who wrote this book, "Those Who Fall," and uh, he. Um, a good friend of mine from New York sent me the book, and what a book. He had a, a, about the third uh, chapter in the, that book was the Those Who Fall is the name of the book. And he had a chapter on the Regensburg mission, which was B-17 coming from England and from uh, an airfield in Italy, which we had captured at the <coughs> time. And um, um, he wrote about that um, mission, how tough it was, how difficult, and, and he, it was beautiful. It scares you to read it because how could it be so tough? But he wrote it from his standpoint as the pilot of the plane. But he's, uh, and it took him 40 years after the war to calm down enough to write that book. Uh, so it impressed me tremendously. Uh, but then, um, well, that's it. Okay. Um, from Wendover, where did you go? Oh, went to, uh, we flew overseas. Uh, a little training in uh, uh, Idaho, and then we flew overseas. Did you buzz any steeples or towers or farms or anything on your way out? It seems to be a, a practice. No, because Wendover is in the middle of a desert, <laughs> like, and there wasn't a tree in sight. There was a mountain or two in the distance. It looked like they had green lake. something. Yeah. yeah. No, there was nothing to uh, say goodbye to except hello, England. Okay, and did you? What base did you go to in England? Pardon? Where, where were you based in England? Uh, a town named Thetford, uh, and Thetford was the, air, the little town adjacent to the airfield that we inherited for, with our 35 B-17s and our crews. We went over, by the way. There were 400 of us that, in the air crew that flew the B-17s. Um, 
when the war ended, when you counted those, there were, there were 1,200 that had been shot down. Because as they were shot down, they were replaced. People came in, and that's a tough, a pretty So you tough. had a 300 percent casualty rate? So that's exactly right. But you didn't notice it because, well, you noticed an empty bed when they were gone, but then they were filled up very quickly. So it was a tough, it was a tough part. We were there um, when, in the uh, uh, end of the summer of 1943, was the beginning for me, and uh, how many? That that happened to be the toughest time of the B-17 war. They they could, had no fighter support, and it was it was difficult. At the time you arrived, summer of '43, um, how many combat missions were you expected to make before you could go home? Twenty-five. 25. Twenty-five was the key number. As the war went on, they kept raising it, as you know, and that. No, no, it would. It was while well, the war was in the air, was really tough, and there was, it, you know, their chances of coming back were pretty low. Um, they didn't change the twenty-five. However, for someone like John that you saw a week or so ago. Uh, he had to do 35, but he arrived there late 44 when the, uh, there was not so much danger. We had fighters that could cover the bombers all the way in and all the way out of a mission. We didn't have that. What kind of fighter protection, if any, did you have when you arrived there? Almost none. You were we over naked. A, 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 they had a big thunderbolt they call the uh, fighter plane. Before it, it, it could go maybe uh, 20 miles inside the coast of uh, where we w crossed the uh, English Channel and go into inland from there. They could, they, and there were no fighter, enemy fighters there. So basically, we had no, from that point on, in. We had a problem. The second, the, the first mission I went on was a, a bombing of Paris, if I recall. And we, the fighters were with us all over the, the channel. But once we hit land, they were out of gas. They had to come back. Yeah. But, but and the interesting thing is, by comparison, when on my 26th, which is a volunteer mission, when I went to uh, the first shuttle mission from England to Poltava, way deep in Russia, we had fighter escorts all the way. That was the improvement they made in fighter protection. That's an interesting, very few people think of that, but that's a very important part. Charles, I, I'm not saying let's skip your 25 missions, but I want to be very sure we covered that shuttle flight you made to Russia. So why don't you tell us about that now? What is or was a shuttle flight? Why did you go? And what happened to you on that mission? Why was there a shuttle uh, mission? Because the Air Force was trying to get work out of Stalin permit for a uh, landing field where we could land there. Now the point of that is, we had a limited distance from England to a target in Germany somewhere. We had a limited, because that once we crossed that point, we couldn't get back with enough gas to, ink to our target. If we had an airfield in Russia that we could work, it would open up a lot of new key targets for us. You follow that? Uh, and that's why the uh, the uh, big wigs, I'll call them this way, to, uh, sold it up to Stalin, but he didn't like giving up at an airfield. And he didn't allow any uh, defense uh, guns or anything there. You want to use this, land at this airfield, fine. And of course, you, you heard the bad news. We, uh, we did a good bombing job on a beautiful job on uh, uh, a target 
in well into Poland. It was an oil refinery. And then we went in f all the way into Poltava and landed. <coughs> and that night, the uh, Germans came over with their bombers because they knew there was no. They, it was a turkey shoot for them because there was no. Bom not, not one gun. There was one gun, but I think the first bomb they dropped hit the bomb, hit the gun, the defensive gun. And uh, Doolittle, who was the general in charge of the whole operation, in his book that he wrote about his own history, he said that uh, he said a lot about that because he, every time he met a, a German, he he was upset that uh, you know he couldn't had to do that and not have the. Did the that bombing raid that night? Did that destroy all of your planes? Not a one could fly. About, uh, I'd say, not pretty close to 85 to 90 percent were destroyed, and a few could be repaired and eventually flew out of there. But that shows you, it was a turkey shoot. They did. You know, they just kept coming and dropping until they got what they wanted. Too bad. So there you are. Um. Oh, there I was. The interesting part is, for me was I was part of a group of five that were flown up to Moscow to make a report, a radio message over to the United States saying, no, we've got this guy surrounded. Uh, except when we, when we landed up in uh, Moscow and we were uh, set up for a five-day trip, um, the um, what was that? I was in Moscow, yeah. The uh, people at the embassy there got word from uh, Mr. Stalin, no, you're not going to make any message to uh, America because, of because, because, you know why? He was embarrassed that, uh, you know. It, it just happened to be a, a total failure. Yeah, that's right. And he didn't want any part of that, so that was it. So I was there in, in uh, Moscow for five days with nothing to do but go to the opera and that kind of stuff. It was wonderful for me. Maybe that's why I'm so calm all the time. I don't know. But it was beautiful. And it was interesting. We went to the uh, opera house off Red Square, and uh, it was surrounded by the citizens of, of many of the citizens of Moscow who loved the opera, but there are so many uh, foreigners coming in, taking up seats, but they were, there must have been 300. And they all dressed alike, by the way. They all had an army uniform, all citizens and everyone else. And they wanted to go in to see that, and maybe two might have gotten in, but they, Every night they must have been there and not mob just to get to see. Mm. So that was interesting. You, I don't want you to skip something here about uh, how you got home from Moscow and you're stopping off at a place called um, Makalaka? No, Makashkala on the Caspian. Good, my Russian. It <laughs> it's, okay. It's vastly improved. Well, we, we had no airplane to get, fly home. So the Air Transport Command was told us fly around the loop and land there and pick us up and fly us home. And the flight home had to be not in, over enemy territory, but another big loop. And the first uh, stopover after uh, the uh, you leave uh, Poltava was Makashkala on the Caspian. And the, where we landed was not an airport, but a wheat field. And it was an airport, but the ever, the, all the living conditions were all underground. Uh, and they, that was almost in sight of Stalingrad. That's how close it came, but it was never taken by the Germans, but only because the Germans got tied down in uh, Stalingrad. They really got tied down. That saved the God, you can say that saved the world, possibly, the, if they would taken that. Uh, in any event, we would get go down underground in a wonderful uh, underground 
uh, s s a small city where they had to, they kept the airplanes and everything down there. And we had a wonderful uh, barbecue, lamb barbecue, which they were ex experts at. And it was tremendous. And it was a, the funniest thing about it to me was there was no one there expecting us, and so there was not one person in Russia that speak Russia that could understand a word of English. Now, we didn't have anyone who could understand <laughs> Russian, so here, but they put on a tremendous uh, dinner for it, barbecue, and so help me, I can taste that barbecue lamb right now, the way they fixed it. And the, uh, the only thing that was, it was really kind of cute and funny was the commander there who could know English. He did raise his, his uh, vodka glass, and it was a big one, like this. And he said, uh, uh, how did it go? Uh, Hitler, well, that's what it was. He says, Hitler. And he spit on the floor and jumped up and down on the spittle. And then, when everybody quieted, that, you know, there's quite a roar from the, all our, the boys that were there. Uh, and then he said, Roosevelt, yeah! And he downed that whole glass, and we went crazy. <laughs> You're lucky you got out of there alive. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. No, but they can do that. They drink it all the time like water. But it was interesting. And then we flew from there to Tehran, uh, where we landed and stayed overnight. And then we flew to Casablanca for the last landing in, in Africa. A and then the final, we had to go around well, Europe, really, instead of across it like we did. And we uh, went from Casablanca to England, back to the days. In reading this uh, this adventure the other night, I was impressed by the fact that you had to take such a circuitous route to get home. That it shows the strength of the German Air Force and uh, yeah. their air defenses. That you had to go to Tehran and then Casablanca, and then up to England from there. Mm -hmm. I was impressed by that. The only way we could do it, we couldn't cross uh, the other, the rest of Europe was still covered by the enemy. We've gone out of sequence here, and I, I want to be sure we get back to the fact that you did fly 25 missions, but the episode you just talked about, you volunteered for, and you had already completed your missions. That's correct. And your, your records say, although he had completed his operational tour, he volunteered to participate in the shuttle mission to Russia. I think that speaks well of your wanting to get the job done well, because it, it, it was part of the effort not to have the bombers turn around and go home, but to continue on to bases in Russia. Well, there's a, I think there's a truth that has to be told about that. Um, I would not select a to lead the, by the way, our group led the 8th Air Force on this mission, so if you're the bombardier in the f front plane of, the fr of our group and all the other groups are behind you, you you're up there getting a, a trip, uh, looking at the, the world like you'll never get again. And I was not assigned to be the leader because I was a uh, training officer and out of it. But the fellow that was supposed to be in the lead of our group, and then all the others, was uh, Bartuska was his name, but he was in London on leave and they couldn't find him. And so they came to me, are you, are you at all interested to do this? And I said, it took me about three seconds. I said, <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> and then that three seconds came back to me when the bombs were falling all around him. We were sleeping in tents. And he bombed for coming down, and I began to say, yeah, I three seconds. I volunteered for this. <laughs> so that's Let's that's, get that's back story. to an operational question here. You have used the phrase, you were lead bomber, lead bomber, lead, lead bombardier. Yeah. 
tell us about toggle bombing and the difference between independent operations, each plane is on its own, yeah. and a whole fleet drops at once, yeah. drops them at once. Would you explain that function to us? Well, very simple. If, you, if, every, if you send up in your group four squadrons making about 30 airplanes that are flying wing to wing for security from fighters coming in because they have a lot of gunpowder going out that way. Um, if you uh, if you drop bombs individually, they would be uh, well. They would have plowed up probably half of the uh, uh, tree areas of Germany. Uh, that's how difficult it is for everybody to get the same thing. So they, the, there's a lead plane, which I was in, and that one. And that's one of the reasons I volunteered. I wanted to. I knew when I was up there on that long trip, all of Europe would just be opening up, and it would clear weather all the way. It was a wonderful trip for me. Uh, but, the, but when one, the the lead ship has to do the the from the point where they turn into the target, he has to do all the bomb site work, and he drops. The minute everybody, all the other 25 airplanes in the group watch that the point when they see the first bomb come out, they all just throw a switch and all go together. And then when they hit, if my aim is good and they hit the target, almost total wipeout. So that's that was the logic to it, and that's how it worked. Tell us about something else that, uh, that is a very large part of your record, that you were aware of the fact that the Germans, in countermeasures, were starting to set off smoke flares when you approached the target. They'd cover it with smoke, or the, or the weather might be bad after there's just a hole in the uh, one particular area. You figured out that there was a problem there, and you figured out a solution to it. And I think it's called grid... Um, grid bombing, yeah. Grid bombing. Would you tell us about that, please? Yeah. Basically, it was a copy of... Uh, if you're using the, the uh, bomb site, the Norden bomb site, you had to see the target. You had to see the and focused exactly on the park. And when you, the bomb site told you when you reach the point in the air where you, the, you drop your bomb, you're going to hit the target. That was the, the basis. The British d uh, didn't have that. They had a, a grid bombing method. They used a, a, a sh plastic sheet with some numbers on it and did their best. And it was, it was loose and it didn't do much. Maybe it was it was never considered, a, it, it was the best they could do, but a, it wasn't a, a good system. So what, uh, what I figured out when we went to a long, this was to Gdynia in Poland, way over in the Baltic Sea. It was as far as you can go on a B-17 group and then turn around and get back home without, with, without losing uh, the airplane from the lack of gas. So. Um, the whole point was, I, I said, look, at, uh, I, tr I tried a number of systems. I had the time. I wasn't flying anymore at that point. I was uh, running the uh, bombardiers of the squadron. And uh, I figured out if I used the British grid system and, and then took the uh, the bomb the 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 bombardier in, in the plane with the Norden, pick a place in fact at Cadenia, that was the first time I went in, and we were, we had targets fixed. They were, they had a tremendous smoke screen there that you couldn't see the target. That's how uh, effective it was. So I figured out if you aim it's something you can see this side of the of the, of the uh, smoke. 
and then measure on your map the distance from there, and you're on a, the right line. But this is very simple. I'm showing you. And then drop the instead of dropping on your aim point, know the direction you're going, and you drop the bomb after 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds, because the airplane keeps going. And then you have a chance to hit it. And um, it worked for a while, but uh, that just happened to be the time when the, uh, they began to learn and have a radar system so they could do the same thing with radar and more accurately. So my timing was a little late in history, but at least that's how it worked. Can you figure that out? Yeah. Well, I can figure it out only in that uh, I understand that you perceived the problem that had really plagued the Air Force and that you did something about it, but your answer came just about the time radar came. Yeah, came. right. Well, that's, that's history. That's, yeah, that's history, the but they, at least they, they used it a number of, oh, maybe 20 times in different targets and it worked fine. The, uh, in this particular case, by the way, uh, because I couldn't see the target, um, we were out over the uh, North Sea uh, Ocean part of uh, Poland. Uh, and, well, I couldn't drop bombs, so we went out and like to do a, a talk to the pilot to do a big turn around and come right back for that same part, line up with that part if you can, because maybe I'll see through some of the smoke and, uh, and uh, hit, it, hit it. And the, uh, there was the, the co-pilot, I don't want to mention name, but he was the biggie going for this. And when I told the uh, 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 item, make the turn, he's, he came on and he said, no, drop your bombs, we're going. And I said, I'm not dropping these bombs. <laughs> And we'll make, you know, until we get a chance. No, oh, come hated, all that distance? People hated to go around again. I, oh, yeah. Because yeah. the, the, the flak is heavy over there, and it was heavy there. But, uh, and my pilot, a wonderful man, he said, well, we're following you, baby. And we went uh, back, and I did see an opening in the smoke. And we got a, uh, and we, we hit that, and it turned out to be a large uh, vessel of some kind. They had a they have they, they had some kind of a name to it, which I don't remember. But uh, well, at least we what else we did to the damage to the uh, port. That's it. Let's put two things together here that you've mentioned. Um, it's hard for laymen who've never been in that position to appreciate what it's like to sit in the nose of a B-17. You've got nothing but plexiglass in front of you. You've got the best view in the world. No question. And you're also probably the best equipped guy in the plane to see the flak in front of you. What's it like to see that box of flak right in front of you and there's nothing but a quarter inch of plexiglass between you and it? And you're, you're the nose of the plane. You're going to be the first guy into that. And yet you tell us you were calm, serene. How can you be that in that situation? I don't know. I don't know how I, uh, uh, you could hear it, you could see it. Sometimes it was so thick you could almost land an airplane on it. But um, I, I must have, uh, I don't know, I just must have uh, had a, feeling I wouldn't be hurt. Yeah, I don't know. I've never tried to figure that one out. But uh, that's how it worked. Did you sort out in your mind another distinction that can be made here? If you had your druthers, what were you most concerned about? Fighter planes or flak? Enemy fighter planes or flak? Well, the flak, uh, enemy pl uh, fighter plane was the big, the big concern. Flak comes and goes pretty quickly because you're coming onto a target and that's where all well, the guns are they shoot up at you and do their best. Uh, quite often 
they would uh, be off on the right level and you're flying just a little above them or lot. But we had generally pretty good luck of not losing too many planes except on my second mission. We had bo both engines knocked out and that's where we had to come down out of the formation, down on the ground, and we flew all the way from uh, Bremen, all the way to, uh, to uh, back to the base. So uh, there's no uh, explanation. I can never n figure out uh, why I was, until, why I was calm, until this fellow from Quincy wrote the book, Those Who Fall, and I realized that it took him 40 years to calm down before he could write that book. And when I read that book, for the first time, I got scared. It's just interesting. Because he was talking to about the uh, specific mission, the Regenberg mission. And I was on that mission coming from a different direction. Uh, you came up from the south? He came up from uh, an airfield they had captured in Italy. Yeah. And we came in from, uh, you know, our base in England. Can you s go back a minute here to morning briefings where you get up at a god-awful hour and you go into a tent and you get a briefing and they pull back the, the sheet to show you your target and you see it's Regensburg, which is probably as far as you can go and hope to get back from there. What are the feelings in this group of tired guys who, you know, we're hoping that you'd go over and do something on the French coast? When you see Regensburg up there. Yet, um the reaction was a loud physical moan from everybody, all the people that were going to fly. And they were sitting in a room in chairs and it would be an awful moan. Uh, they knew, but they knew they had to go. Uh, I don't know how else to explain it. They, if it was a short strip of map on the map, which means it was in, in the coast and back out, cheer. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. We've never asked this question here before, Charles. So it's Regensburg, and guys have maybe done 20, 22 missions. Did anybody just say, I'm not going to do it, or I can't do it? I simply can't get up th today to do that. It's hard to answer that, but uh, we do know that there was a, um, on any mission, there would be, after you get the formation up in the air over the coast of uh, England and ready to cross the water, two, three, sometimes four uh, bombers would t drop out and turn around and go back. And they would, the, whatever their excuse was, a lot were legitimate excuses, um, but some were uh, not legitimate. And the and they go back and land. And say uh, I had a low oil uh, pressure on engine three, and I couldn't go in. You know that. But we never had to do that. Thank God. Was there only was the only penalty attached to that that they didn't get credit for a mission and had to go back out again? There was no punishment or uh, grounding, as it were. No. Um, within the last month, I happened to catch a um, his a little history somewhere, some magazine I saw, uh, maybe put up by our group, that uh, answered that question. And uh, s quite often, some uh, people were penalized, and a lot of a lot of them had a legitimate problem with the airplane, and they, so that there was two groups. Uh, to answer your question, and uh, they weren't penalized then, but uh, at least they were it's on their record and in their minds for the rest of their lives. You never know. 
Richard Tregascus, who's noted for his book on Guadalcanal, if, if nothing else, wrote an article in the Saturday Evening Post in May of 1946. Um, and I, I think I'm quoting correctly about you. He had solemnly resolved in the middle of the war to donate six or seven years of his life to study so that he could build a better world than the one he'd helped to destroy as a bombardier. He decided to study city planning at Harvard. Tell us about this in your life. Well, it's very simple. Uh, I did take a, got a master's degree from, uh, in city planning as a graduate course. Um, I became a city planner uh, right away. Um, and um, it just so happens that the, the way America works, um, it, the, I just discovered there's no way I could uh, build, rebuild cities as a dream city in America because there are too many pieces that are all independent and depending on different uh, economic forces. So um, I didn't have a chance. On individual projects I put together, one up in Lowell, um, I was able to uh, save a big church in an area that we wanted that was falling apart and needed redevelopment. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Worcester as a um, uh, the chief planner for projects, and uh, we did a lot, got a lot done uh, that way. But the dream of uh, changing how America works to build its cities was unrealistic from my standpoint. It just didn't happen that way. The cities expanded, as you probably know, uh, just when the individual people would buy a, a track, the contractor would go in and build the units. And um, there were a few places where they've had they had a couple of larger examples of some good planning for the city. But um, I just learned the hard way: you had to become a, an American to uh, build cities, <laughs> and they didn't do it the dreamy way. Okay. That's a good answer. With what rank um, did you end the war? A captain. I was a captain at the end. And you brought in some of your decorations today. Would you be kind enough to show them to us on camera? Well, I'd be happy to. Um, I, basically, um, when you get a medal, this happens to be the Distinguished Flying Cross. Um, and I won this three different times. One was for that mission to Gdynia. Another was for a mission um, in uh, Hanover. Um, but um, it's the highest uh, medal you can get, uh, short of uh, being shot to death and getting posthumously, uh, the, like many have, the, uh, the highest, this is falling apart, shows you how little I see it. Uh, but that's, uh, that's that. I also got the air medal, which all the flyers would get after they finished. Um, I think it was, yes, uh, something like 15 missions. Uh, or they would get one at the end of the 25 they had to fly. But that's, uh, this is a distinguished flying cross. So, I, and I got three of those. Tell us about coming home. Did you, uh, you weren't married at that time? No. No. What, what, what was your family that you came home to? Well, I, first of all, I, when I came back from England, I went to, uh, a, to a flying school and began training for, uh, to become a pilot. And there are three phases of that. There's a uh, primary, 
the, uh, the middle mission and then the final. And I was going into the final mission when the war ended and uh, within two days I was out. <laughs> I wanted to get back in, into uh, civilization. And uh, my family lived in California at the time and that's where I uh, went of course. And then my neighbor was still alive. It helped me write a letter to Harvard and I got you know, into Harvard and the rest was history for me. Did you tell your neighbor how you had profited from his uh, being so kind to you and what those chess games resulted in? Well, as I, I forget if I told you that uh, he, we'd learned to play chess. I learned well from him. And I spent a lot of time when I had to leave in London, London to uh, look for a gift for him. And finally one day I was walking by a, uh, a gift shop, one of those English gift shops, and there was an antique a set of chess players. It was just a beautiful thing and I went in and I, uh, the, the price was uh, a little high but I wanted it. And when I came home, went home, uh, I gave it to him and he, he was a nice. He just, uh, you could tell the way he accepted it. I could hardly hear, understand him at that point. And uh, it was about two years later that he died. But we did have a chance to play a few games on that chess set, so it was wonderful. That was very thoughtful. I'm looking back at what you've talked about in the last hour and wonder what you would pick out as being in your career the most memorable experience of your experiences, uh, varied experiences. Is there one that uh, comes back to you more often than the others? Well, there is one. Um, I can, I can respond this way if you allow it, was um, there was one experience and that was when I got this book that my friend sent me, the, um, Those Who Fall. When I read that book, I couldn't believe that I had as many emotions as any other human being and I don't know why they were buried but when I read that book I came apart and here that if you don't mind I can tell you exactly I wrote to the friend that sent me the book please do I could if I could read this as, as and here's what I said I said I wish I could explain how those unique juices in the human body we call the past the present and the future can do what they do. Those who fall, which is the book, made mine flow again with the speed of yesterday. Every second I was in the air returned to me in a total recall, and that's true. With the chemical and the metaphysical flow united in a patch of memory that res resonated on every nerve and every sensibility, every moral and volitional charm cord in my body, and that's true. I couldn't believe what was happening. How was that possible? Well, I have no idea. Not that I haven't tried to figure it all out, but I have a long given up trying to attach such experiences to human reason, expecting an answer from such a limited area. In any event, the part of the war that we were in is still alive and well, and for me, closer to reality now than it was then, when by all rational logic it should have been closer to reality then than it is now. This is true, that's what I said. It is almost as though human experience requires the future to be lived so that in the subsequent present, the truth that was the past thus enhanced can be revealed. Simply put, there is more Netishol. Netishol is our air base. 
that we flew out of. There was more netishol in me today than there was then. No doubt, man is a time-bound, multi-dimensional animal. In the past, when it was then the present and only a becoming, it was, as I see it, a mere prelude to hum under human understanding of what took place. Yes. So what spills out there, out here, onto this page are just a few thoughts a few ideas about the architecture of what a human thought might look like. A memory, a war, a Sid Dean, the fellow that sent me the book, a friend, a dream with which one can build a concrete foundation for the next day, a dream he cannot stand on and will carry his weight unto the next day. And the day after that, a dream without reality would be null and void. Or so I think. And for those who fall, we owe so much, so much more than we will ever know. Charles, that was very eloquent. We've, uh, we've been at this a little over an hour. I wonder, um, by way of um, coming to an end, is there anything I haven't asked you here today that you would like to comment on, like your family to know, uh, like future historians to hear about what happened to you in the United States military? Well, it's hard to answer that because um, I went on through college after I, when I got home and, uh, and in 1949, just by some godly good fortune, I met a wonderful woman and we've been married 40, 52 years now. And she's just a wonderful, wonderful person. So that was God's gift to me. Five beautiful children. We now have seven grandchildren. They're all great. Charles, thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much, yourself. Wonderful. <laughs>